recording has started. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Allison McKenzie, and I am chair, the chair of the Historic Conservation Board. I would like to take a minute to remind everyone about the rules of this proceeding. This proceeding is at all times governed by the rules of procedure adopted by the board on September 26, 2011, amended March 23rd, 2015, last amended March 9th, 2020. A copy of the rules of procedure is available for review online. All those planning to testify today, which does not include those solely making arguments such as attorneys, should stand and take an oath administered by the board's attorney. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. As such, the board reserves the right to deliberate in private. The Ohio rules of evidence do not apply to this hearing. However, professional rules of conduct do apply and candor to the tribunal is required. The board members are citizen volunteers and are not paid for their service. They're treated as public officials under Ohio law and any attempt to influence them, including but not limited to bribery, intimidation, retaliation, which may include contacting their employer in an attempt to exert influence is punishable as a crime. All should be aware that this meeting is being recorded. Therefore, please speak clearly into your microphone and state your name and address for the record. In the event of any technical difficulties with the video conferencing technology, I may continue or postpone this hearing at my discretion. All participants providing testimony must, must have both camera and audio features turned on in order to participate. With that said, let's proceed with the first item. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be um, giving the information about the first um, application, which is um, 5932 Hamilton Avenue, um, Kiki's Japanese Restaurant. Um, so Kiki's at 5932 Hamilton Avenue in College Hill is requesting relief in the form of a use permit for an outdoor area within 100 feet of a residential transect, approval of outdoor of an outdoor area exceeding 50% of the size of the indoor area. Um, their indoor space is 1400 square feet and the outdoor space they are requesting to use is 2947 square feet. Um, they are also asking for approval for an outdoor area with entertainment within 500 feet of a residential transect boundary. Um, the outdoor area will be screened by fencing, trees, and planters as submitted per plans. Um, ambient music is proposed um, to be played on speakers facing in towards the dining area. Um, live music is proposed for the future, um, but is not currently um, something they are asking for. Um, the location is within the College Hill designated outdoor refreshment area um, or DORA, which was established in June of 2022 by city council. Um, so that's a quick um, overview of the project. Um, and you can see the um, plans are up here on the screen. Um, so staff recommends that the Historic Conservation Board take the following action. Um, that they approve section, the zoning relief requested per section 1703-5.100 I-1, approve the use permit or conditional use um, that's required for an outdoor area within 100 feet of a T3 zoning transect per section 1703-5.100 I-2, approve the use permit, conditional use for an outdoor area exceeding 50% of the size of the indoor area within 500 feet of a residential district boundary. And per section 1703-5-100, section five, approve the use permit, conditional use for an outdoor area with entertainment within 500 feet of a residential district boundary with the following conditions. Um, that any live music proposed in the future should be limited to the current hours that the business is open. Um, they're currently open in, until 10 p.m. Um, ambient music provided by speakers facing inwards towards the dining entertainment areas shall be allowed. Um, and also the noise ordinance in the municipal city code does not address the form-based code transects. Um, this is in form-based code. 
um, as it was adopted prior to the form-based code in 2012. Therefore, a similar zone to the T5MS was determined to be the commercial community zone and decibel levels from that zoning district on the receiving district were used. Decibel levels as measured by a sound level meter at the closest residential district line shall not exceed the maximum level outlined in section 909-3 of the Cincinnati Municipal Code, specifically um, the hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sunday through Thursday is 60 decibels. From 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. Sunday through Thursday, it's 55 decibels. 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Friday through Saturday, 65 decibels. And 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. Friday through Saturday is 60 decibels. Um, the finding um, is that the board make the determination that per section 1435-05-4, that such relief from literal implication of the zoning code will not be material detrimental to the public health, safety, and welfare or injurious to property within the district or vicinity where the property is located, and that it is necessary and appropriate in the interest of historic conservation so as not to adversely affect the historic architectural or aesthetic integrity of the district. Um, and as, as for the certificate of appropriateness, staff recommends that the Historic Conservation Board approve a certificate of appropriateness for 5932 Hamilton Avenue per plans and renderings submitted by Team B Architecture and Design dated 3-9-2023, including any revisions submitted for permit subject to staff review and approval with the following conditions that the board, the building permits must be issued within two years of the decision date or the certificate of appropriateness shall expire. And that the board makes this determination per section 1435-09-2, that the property owner has demonstrated by credible evidence that the proposal substantially conforms to the applicable conservation guidelines. Thank you. It looks like we have an applicant and architect signed up for this, uh, Ms. Green and Mr. Corns. Would either of you like to add anything to the staff report? If so, we'll get you uh, sworn in. Um, only if there are any questions that need to be addressed. Um, I do also have a community council uh, member signed up. Um, before I go to that person, uh, does the board have any questions for either staff or the owner applicant? If not, um, I, the community council member I have signed up is Abigail Tissot. Uh, do you have anything to add? If so, we'll get you sworn in. Uh, actually, I'm here for the 213 Woodward. Project, not this one. Okay. Um, which one is that, Cassandra? So I can make sure to call on her again. That would be I item number three. 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 Okay. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Um, any uh, other questions, comments? Uh, if not, I will uh, entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I'll move that we uh, approve the zoning relief and the certificate of appropriateness for 5932 Hamilton Avenue, including those provided by staff in the report. Second. Okay. okay, we'll call the roll. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sunderman? Aye. Mr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. Zalasco? Aye. Mr. Young? Yes. Uh, Mr. Voss. Yes. The chair votes aye. Thank you. It looks like you are approved to go. Uh, we'll move on to item number two. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will also be presenting um, the application for um, 5905 Hamilton Avenue, um, which is the Brink Brewing Company, and they are also located in the College Hill um, Mid-Business Historic District, and it is also a T5MS um, zone, the same as the um, Kiki's. So the Brink Brewing Company at 5905 Hamilton Avenue um, is requesting relief in the form of a use permit for an outdoor area within um, 100 feet of a T4 transect. 
Um, and they are also requesting approval of an outdoor area that exceeds 50% of the size of the indoor area. Um, in their case, they have an indoor area of 3,142 square feet and are requesting an outdoor area um, expansion to 3,659 square feet. Um, they also, uh, very similar to Kiki's, plan to do um, screening around this outdoor entertainment area um, to include some fencing, um, trees, ground cover um, in the form of grass, planters, um, and they also plan to do some shade sales over part of the outdoor area. Um, they also um, expect to have ambient music played on speakers facing in towards the dining area. Um, they also have proposed um, live music potentially in the future. Um, they are also within the College Hill DORA, um, which was established in June 2022 by City Council. Um, so they have a very similar situation to Kiki's. Um, so as far as the zoning relief, staff recommends that the board, Historic Conservation Board take the following actions for the zoning relief um, per section 1703-5.100 I1, approve the use permit or conditional use approval for an outdoor dining area within 100 feet of a T4 transect. Um, per section 1703-5.100 I2, approve the use permit or conditional use approval for an outdoor area exceeding 50% of the size of the indoor area within 500 feet of a residential district boundary. And per section 1703-5.100 I-5, approve the use permit or conditional use approval for an outdoor area with entertainment within 500 feet of a residential district boundary with the following conditions. Um, any live music proposed in the future should be limited to hours that are same as the DORA. Um, those hours currently run until 11 p.m. Ambient music provided by speakers facing inwards towards the dining entertainment area shall be allowed. The noise ordinance in the municipal city code, again, does not address form-based code transects as it was adopted prior to the form-based code. Therefore, a similar zone to T5MS was determined to be commercial community zone and decibel levels from that zoning district on the receiving district were used. Decibel levels as measured by a sound level meter at the closest residential district line shall not exceed the maximum level outlined in section 909-3 of the Cincinnati Municipal Code, specifically 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sunday through Thursday, 60 decibels, 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. Sunday through Thursday, 55 decibels, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Friday through Saturday is 65 decibels, and 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. Friday through Saturday is 60 decibels. Um, and the board makes this determination that per section 1435-0504, such relief from literal implication of the zoning code will not be materially detrimental to the public health, safety, and welfare, or injurious to property within the district or vicinity where the property is located, and that it is necessary and appropriate in the interests of historic conservation so as not to adversely affect the historic architectural or aesthetic integrity of the district. And for the certificate of appropriateness, um, staff recommends that the Historic Conservation Board approve a certificate of appropriateness for 5905 Hamilton Avenue per plans and renderings submitted by Team B Architecture and Design, dated 3-9-2023, including any revisions submitted for permit subject to staff review and approval with the following conditions. Um, staff recommends the shade sales will be made of canvas and that the building permits must be issued within two years of the decision date or the certificate of appropriateness shall expire. Um, and for the finding, the board makes this, this, this determination per section 1435-09-2 that the property owner has demonstrated by credible evidence that the proposal substantially conforms to the applicable conservation guidelines. Thank you. Uh, we do have uh, the same applicant, Ms. Green, and architect, uh, Mr. Korn, signed up for this. Would either of you like to add to this case? Uh, if so, we'll, we'll swear you in. Seeing head shakes, okay. Um, we have a few uh, folks signed up. Uh, it looks like uh, Ms. Pergata, anything to add today? No. Mr. Sorry about that. Um, nothing to add? 
Nothing to add. Great, thank you. I think that is it for who has signed up and checked in. Did I miss anyone? Look, look like there's someone, Melissa Merce, that did you? I don't have her listed as checked in, but oh, okay. Ms. Merce, okay. anyone see her? Well, I signed up uh, for 213 Woodward. That's probably the next item. Okay, so we need to put you on item three instead of two. That's right. Okay. Um, any questions from the, the board? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve both the zoning relief and the certificate of appropriateness as laid out by staff. Second. I will call the roll. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sunderman? Aye. Uh, Mr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. Zelasco? Aye. Mr. Young? Yes. And Mr. Voss? Aye. The chair votes aye. Uh, looks like that has passed. Thank you. And we'll move on to item number three. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will also be presenting item three for 213 um, Woodward. Um, so 213 Woodward Avenue or Woodward Street um, is located in the CCP zoning district in over the Rhine historic district. Um, this applicant is also requesting um, a conditional use approval for an outdoor area that exceeds 50% of the size of the indoor area within 500 feet of a residential district boundary. Um, and also um, conditional use approval um, is being requested for an outdoor area with entertainment within 500 feet of a residential district boundary. Um, this, um, this is a new building here in Over the Rhine. Um, it's here at the corner of Woodward and Hanover. Um, it is adjacent to Ziegler Park. Um, the pool is immediately across the street here. Um, and it is just a short distance off of Main Street. Um, so that there are several eating and drinking establishments located in the area. Um, there is also residential housing um, in the area. It's essentially a mixed, very much of a mixed use area. Um, so the outdoor area that is proposed um, at one at the corner at the western corner, there will be an outdoor area that is essentially enclosed by a half wall, by a canopy, um, and by additional planters. Um, on Hanover Street, which is going to be closed off, um, there will be an outdoor area that will be enclosed by fencing, um, a wood slat fence. Um, it will be six feet tall facing towards the park area, which is to the right. Um, or east here. Um, so this outdoor area um, is proposed to also have um, planters within the indoor area to help um, both screen and buffer the noise from the outdoor area. Um, they are also requesting um, to have speakers um, to play ambient background music in both the outdoor area at the west side and this outdoor area on the east side. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview for this project. Um, and staff recommends that the Historic Conservation Board take the following actions. Um, for zoning relief per section 1419-21C, um, approve the conditional use approval for the outdoor area exceeding 50% of the size of the indoor area within 500 feet of a residential district boundary. Um, and I would also just note that the indoor area at this location is only 596 square feet. Um, so they do need this additional outdoor area, um, you know, just to make the business more viable. Um, the outdoor area that they are asking for is 1,061 square feet. 
um, per, and also per section 1419-21E, um, staff recommends historic conservation board approve the conditional use approval required for the outdoor area with entertainment within 500 feet of a residential district boundary with the following conditions that no live entertainment shall be allowed within the outdoor areas. Only the ambient music provided by speakers facing inwards towards the dining areas shall be allowed. Decibel levels as measured by a sound level meter at the closest residential district line shall not exceed the maximum level outlined in section 909-3 of the Cincinnati Municipal Code, specifically from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sunday through Thursday, 60 decibels from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Sunday through Thursday, 55 decibels, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Friday through Saturday, 65 decibels, and from 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. Friday through Saturday, 60 decibels. Um, also that the operating hours for the outdoor entertainment should be as follows, from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday, and from 8 a.m. to 12 a.m. Friday through Saturday. Um, and these hours are less than what is permitted by the um, decibel levels per the city code. Um, and then for the finding, um, staff recommends that the board make this determination that per section 1435-05-4, that such relief from literal implication of the zoning code will not be material detrimental to the public health, safety, and welfare or injurious to property within the district or vicinity where the property is located, and that it is necessary and appropriate in the interest of historic conservation so as not to adversely affect the historic architectural or aesthetic integrity of the district. Um, and staff recommends for the certificate of appropriateness that the Historic Conservation Board approve a certificate of appropriateness for 213 Woodward Street per plans and rendering submitted by the drawing department applicant dated 3-9-2023 and 4-7-2023, including any revision submitted for permit, subject to staff review and approval with the following conditions, that the building permits must be issued within two years of the decision date or the certificate of appropriateness shall expire. Um, and the finding is that the board makes this determination per section 1435-09-2, that the property owner has demonstrated by credible evidence that the proposal substantially conforms to the applicable conservation guidelines. Um, and I would just add that on um, the applicant did submit a later revision in April asking to paint the exterior of this building um, in the colors that you see here, which is essentially a white color. Um, Typically, painting of an unpainted building would not be permitted, but because this is new construction um, and not an older building, um, staff feels that it is appropriate to allow them to paint this building. Thank you. We do have several uh, owners, applicants, and architects signed up for this uh, item. If you're an owner, applicant, or architect and would like to speak, let's get you sworn in. Uh, anyone like to add to uh, the staff report? Nope. No. Okay. Um, that being said, uh, before we move into members of the public, uh, are there any questions or comments from, from the board for staff or applicants? I do have a question for the uh, owner. What, what's the reason for the paint again? And let's pause. Whoever's going to answer that is going to need to be sworn in. So if you'd like to answer that question, uh, let's uh, turn it over to David to swear you in. Mr. Novak, is, it, is that going to be you? Uh, it's either going to be me or the owner, Garth, who's on this call. Garth, you're on mute. I'll just, I'll just swear oh. both of you, and if you both could raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Okay. Okay, now if you would like to answer, please. Well, I mean, uh, this is Ron Novak with Drawing Department. Um, we've gone through sort of the cultivation of the brand within this space, and we felt to give them the best proposition of standing out um, on the corner with consideration of the closing of Woodward and it becoming a public outdoor space, 
that painting the building would give them the best opportunity to differentiate themselves from the rest of the neighborhood. So it was really just to try to give them a different color within the background of the outdoor space that's being created with the closure of Woodward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Owen, how many of these have we had where non-contributing buildings or new, new construction was painted masonry? You, can you address that? I'm not entirely sure overall. I personally have don't believe that I have reviewed any applications for painting an unpainted infill building. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not completely. I, I understand the priorities for the brand. I'm not crazy about the paint, though. I don't know that's going to get in the way of my vote, but just to go on the record. <clears throat> Okay. Any other questions at this point for owners or applicants before I move on to uh, public comment? Okay. Um, David, do you want to swear in all the public commenters at once or? or... Um, just because I, I'm not sure that we can see them all on the screen at one time. It, um, I, I don't know. Well, actually, let's let's go ahead and try and do that. So anyone who is here from the public to speak on this item, if you could unmute at this time, um, I'll need everyone to raise their right hand and I'll need everyone to answer out loud. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Um, so I will call everyone <laughs> one at a time, uh, just uh, to keep everything straight. I'm going to circle back to the ones that were um, mistakenly on an earlier item. Uh, so that would start with Ms. Tissot, whose name I'm probably butchering, so sorry about that. Actually, that was correct, and few people get it, so thank you. Okay. Uh, would you like to add anything on this item? I would. So I am here speaking on behalf of the Pendleton Neighborhood Council. Pendleton is the residential district that is within 500 feet that was mentioned in the staff report. I wanted to make sure that our concerns were asserted um, and emphasized here, which is that we currently have a business that has been approved for amplified outdoor sound in the exact same proximity as this uh, organization. And unfortunately we have routine problems with the sound well exceeding the limits. And now that that has been approved, uh, the business that we are having trouble with, we, we have very little ability to stop what is happening. And it is consistently negatively impacting our our ability to enjoy our right to peaceful enjoyment. And so it's concerning that even though these complaints are well documented with the police and also the city solicitor's office, that um, the staff report does not see those as valid or sort of concerning uh, issues for homeowners and other residents in the residential area. The other item that we just want to make sure is on the record is that this is adjacent to our park, a park for enjoyment of residents of green space, outdoor play areas, our only pool, and a variety of other amenities for residents. And so um, in addition to it being right by a residential district, it is also on our only park where we have these amenities. And so this ambient noise and the outdoor noise is a significant concern given the hours that have been proposed. Um, it essentially means residents must listen to outdoor noise in an ambient fashion at a a pretty high decibel level most of the time. And it's it's very concerning for those of us who are in a residential area by choice um, to be impacted by the nearby commercial area. And again, this is all well documented um, and we are concerned that it is still being proposed and uh, recommended for approval. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the other one that was uh, signed up for two, but I believe once uh, number three is Mr. Pergata. Did you wanna add to this item? Um, no, nothing. Uh, I am uh, supportive of the uh, the staff's uh, approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will move on to the next person, uh, Mr. Russell. Um, I'll I'll speak um, as a uh, property owner on Woodward Street. First, um, I'm at two hundred seven Woodward which is a mixed use building storefront below and three apartment units above. Um, in that regard, I, I think that the activity proposed here is entirely compatible with 
um, what we'd like to see on the street in terms of activating that space, meaning the Woodward portion of that space um, and providing some vitality along the street. Um, I am concerned as, as a property owner and a, and a landlord that the residents will be inconvenienced by the sound and disturbed. And um, along with other property owners here that represent or have uh, apartment units in their building, um, I, I think we're gonna be very attentive to the concerns of our residents as we have you know, the bottom line of um, their preferences and their rent to consider. Um, so I, I am, um, as, as a property owner, as a landlord, I'm gonna speak in favor of the project as proposed um, with, uh, I hope your understanding that, that we as landlords are gonna be very, very um, focused on enforcement. Um, as, a, as an architect and an urban designer um, who, who focuses on this area of urban design, teaches at the university, again, I think the activity proposed is entirely compatible with what we wanna see happening in this type of urban environment um, with the caveat that again, the enforcement is a key, key issue of what needs to happen. Um, my suggestion here would be understanding that enforcement is probably the biggest hangup here. I'm wondering if some sort of a bond can be posted by the business that could be used as a deterrent for any um, you know, noise that would exceed the regulations. So I'll, I'll leave that to you as the, maybe that's a question to the staff attorney. Mr. Sturkey, would you like to comment on that before we move on to the next uh, signed up? Speaker? Sure, um, the, the board um, does not have any authority to impose a bond um, in that manner. Um, Sometimes businesses and, and nearby uh, community groups can enter into private uh, good neighbor agreements. Uh, but again, that's something that would be outside the, uh, the jurisdiction of, of the board and, and the scope of this particular request. Thank you. Uh, next member of the public uh, signed up and checked in is Ms. Curran. Hey, good afternoon. Um, my name is Caroline Curran. I am a resident on Main Street near the um, intersection of 14th and Main and have been for several years now. Um, so although my residence isn't um, directly adjacent to this exact project, this is an area, as mentioned before, that um, has a lot of this type of activity, a lot of these outdoor dining spaces. Um, so wanted to offer a, a comment in support of the project. Um, I have found through just personal experience that um, these type of dining establishments and being outdoor does add to the vibrancy of the neighborhood, um, particularly knowing that at this time there are, are lots of concerns and discussions and a lot of efforts around the safety, especially at Main Street and extending into to Ziegler Park. Um, I believe that this type of activity um, will only add to the safety there, the vibrancy of the park. Um, I believe that having this type of, of outdoor dining brings um, not only good energy to the area, but also uh, additional eyes and ears that are there in the park, again, helping with any, any safety concerns. And um, then again, just also uh, as, as a resident and having a lot of uh, living there for quite some time around these type of establishments have really found that I have not been disturbed um, by this type of ambient noise, um, knowing that coming to, to a park or this type of residential area, you're looking for um, that type of vibrancy, the energy, um, people to be there and, and a feeling of community and safety that I think um, this type of project will enhance. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Ms. Greenberg signed up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and hello, everyone. My name is Myra Greenberg. I live uh, on Broadway, 1324 Broadway, about a block from this project. And I, from the start, I would like to say I hope you deny all the COAs and all zoning relief. 
I believe that this area next to 213 Woodward is part of the Ziegler Park expansion. That's the way it was promoted in front of city council. That's the way it was presented to the planning commission, December 16th, 2022. While 213 may be zoned CCP, I don't believe the street and the public right of way is zoned CCP. I believe it is part of the greater Ziegler Park, which is should be zoned park. And uh, in terms of the property owner, I believe the property owner is probably the city, not, not the owner of 213 Woodward. I hope that you uh, would see that I, there's this, some very disconnects between property owner and the zoning of the street. Does the zoning of 213 that faces Woodward apply to Hanover? I don't think Hanover Street is zoned CCP if it's part of the Ziegler Park expansion. I hope you will deny it. There are already enough outdoor drinking establishments. If anyone's thirsty, they can go to a number of places along Main Street, uh, Pendleton area even. They do not need to take public right of way possibly the park expansion itself to privatize it for the benefit of a few. And as far as being activating the park, this is behind a six foot fence. And I, I have not seen anything in the packet to the planning commission that was presented December 16th, 2022, that shows that this was going to be privatized space. When you look at the uh, packet, it showed that the part of Hanover Street was all open for public use, none of it privatized. And so now I think we're getting kind of a little bit of a bait and switch on this. I just hope that you would deny it because it, it will present problems, serious real problems. And even if you do approve it, the problems will persist and they will have to contend with them. And frankly, I think it opens up the property owner of 213 Woodward to civil liability if it endangers people. So I really would hope that you would deny it, just deny it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Owen, would you like to respond at all to the zoning? And I, I can't claim to be terribly familiar with this park expansion that passed. So any insight you have? Uh, so the park expansion is basically a, um, it involves the closing of both Woodward Street and Hanover Street to vehicular traffic. Um, the Ms. Greenberg is correct that this was not part of the original plan that was shown uh, with the outdoor area to the east of the building along Hanover Street. Uh, this is a later development, which the applicant has applied for a revocable street privilege as well as uh, the zoning relief and COA that's needed here. So, um, but as far as the zoning is concerned, uh, the entire parcel for 213 Woodward Street is within the uh, boundary of the CCP district. And it looks like the street basically provides that bisection uh, between the CCP and the PR Parks and Recreation District to the east. So uh, with that coming down the center line of Hanover, it looks to basically align with the boundary of that outdoor area that is proposed in that location. Thank you. Uh, looks like we have a few more people signed up. Uh, Elizabeth and John Lacaz. There you go. <laughs> Got to find it. Didn't know we were going to speak, but that's it. <laughs> uh, yes, well, we're in support of, of the project. Uh, we've been here three years now on uh, the corner of 13th and Main. Um, the only uh, cautionary thing that I, I have is that the city doesn't uh, uh, take care of the uh, noise levels on Main Street, especially in front of our building, not, not even close. 
So I, I, it's fine to have these these rules about noise, but if if they're not enforced, if they're not enforced. Uh, they really don't mean anything. Uh, but on balance, I have to say it's a, a fabulous project, and the uh, the project in the park is 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 fantastic, and it's going to benefit the neighborhood quite a bit, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. I have a few members of 3CDC and model group signed up. I'm not sure if you're members of the public on this or if you were owner group, um, but does anyone uh, from those uh, organizations uh, like to speak? I'll speak. Um, I'm actually a resident of Pendleton, um, so I was going to speak personally on this topic. Um, I am very much in support of this. Um, I think it's a crucial component to activating this corner of Over the Rhine. I think it needs um, some activity happening. I think the pool has been great. Obviously, the park is wonderful, but this is kind of the last corner that we need to um, really activate that space. Um, I see the expansion of the patio space greatly benefiting the um, restaurant concept that goes in. Um, you know, they aren't working with a ton of square footage on the inside. So anything that can contribute to their success, um, I would love to see a tenant there long term that can really become a part of the community. Um, I lived in the Finley Market area for about four years, and I greatly benefited from all the street activity going on over there. There's a lot of outdoor patio space, there's live music, and I personally really enjoyed being in that environment. And I think it'll be a great addition to the Ziegler Park neighborhood as well. Thank you. Anyone else uh, for this issue that would like to speak? Mr. Reckman, were you sworn Hi, in? Uh, yeah, my name is Matt Reckman. I'm the um, president of property management with Model Group. So we have um, about 40 units, a mix of market rate and affordable units that are right kind of in this block. Uh, we've got um, units that front Woodward, Yukon, 13th and Main Street there. Um, and we're, we're here speaking in support of this project. Uh, we think the new design for the street on Woodward and adding even more diners out into the street is only a positive for the neighborhood. Um, and echoing a lot of the comments that have already been said about um, the energy and eyes on the street, especially with um, the past year or so of uh, the challenges on Main Street, um, this will be a great add to the block. So we're, we're in support of the project. Thank you. Uh, it looks like uh, someone named Brandy would like to speak. Um, hi, Allison. This is Brandy with 3CDC. I have not officially been sworn in. I'm happy to get sworn in. I just wanted everyone yeah, to Brandy, know that. Uh, Let's Brandy, if you could raise your right hand. Yeah. Uh, do you solemnly swear the testimony you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, yes. Thank you. Um, we're here just to answer questions. 3CDC is the landlord of the building, um, and so I just wanted to make sure everyone know that we're happy to ask any questions, um, answer any questions. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on this item? You know, Madam Chair, could we get, um, I lost her picture now, um, the re the neighbor that spoke earlier that represented Pendleton community uh, about Ms. about Ms. the Jeff? enforcement issue a little bit more? Did they talk yeah. to city council? I mean, what, what where, where has that been left? That's me, Abby Tissot. I'm the president of the Pendleton Neighborhood Council. Am I allowed to speak? Yes. Okay, so um, the enforcement issue, uh, as outlined in the written statement that I provided, has been abysmal, and it has been um, a major problem for those of us who primarily reside in the residential district. So I just wanted to clarify, many of the statements of support have been made by folks who live in the commercial district, right? The folks who are within the same district as this is being proposed. The residential district, we receive a lot of the ambient noise from one particular business located very close by here that, that's also in the same commercial district. We constantly, um, as residents, have to pool our resources and make calls um, to the police to get the police to arrive. We've had to install our own recording software in order to get recordings of the issues. We also unfortunately have been threatened by a business owner that, that this particular issue is about. And so our most of our complaints then had to be made anonymously, which then the police do not track. And so we were told that there were no complaints. So you know, once we've made complaints that have been substantiated, 
we are then threatened. At that point, we had to go to um, the city solicitor to talk about that some more. Uh, we had a conference with uh, the captain of District 1, Captain Matthew Hammer. So we've gone through a lot of additional steps, uh, lots of meetings, other uh, stakeholders who own properties in, again, the residential district across the street, um, with whom we've tried to use their influence to talk with the ownership of the building that houses this business in the commercial district. We have had zero traction. As recently as last weekend, when the business in question opened its outdoor space again, um, the noise that was being collected across the street was well beyond the noise requirement. It went all the way through 3 a.m. Um, and we received the majority of that noise and made many, many complaints. I think there were eight additional complaints made um, by individuals within the district and we have no traction on that either. So the, the big challenge is that the burden of the business and its noise falls on those of us in the residential district where the noise expectation should be lower. And even then trying to get the police to show up trying to get that to be taken seriously, working with the city solicitor against a, maybe a property owner who is not cooperative or who actually desires to be difficult has been even more challenging. And we actually, as recently as last weekend, had more uh, residents in that residential district across the street notify us that they won't be continuing their leases in our neighborhood. So I understand that, um, you know, enforcement is a, is a concern. We've done our due diligence to try to pool our resources, to make numerous calls, to find new strategies, to work with city officials. Um, and for those of us in the area where we are guaranteed more quiet to have this kind of noise that we can't control, that's not legal, um, but for which we have no recourse is quite frustrating. So you're, you're recording actual decibel level and submitting that to the city and they're mm -hmm. not responding. Correct. Accurate? That is correct. Okay, so this is probably an uncomfortable position. I, I think the project is great. I mean, I have kind of watched um, that evolve, the neighborhood evolve down there. And I'm in support of it, but I am very concerned that as a board, we're putting qualifications on projects that are appear to be moot. And I, I don't, this isn't the first time that I've heard this and I just wonder um, if any of the other board members have an opinion maybe we should suspend these kind of um, reliefs until there's some acknowledgement that they mean something um, I'm not sure where to go with this but I kind of like to get the other board members opinion uh, Mr. Tassad, I, I have a question for you. You, you said that you were, uh, you felt threatened by that particular person. And did you mention that to the police? Not only did I video record the threat, it happened during one of our neighborhood council meetings. I also have it documented on social media as well with screenshots and a variety of other forms. And that was provided. Um, so, I mean, it was almost the best of both worlds. We could see it in video. And then again, we could see it in writing from that individual on social media. And those factors, unfortunately, have done nothing for us in terms of gaining traction for actual behavior change. Um, there was a meeting with this business owner, um, but there's been no behavior change. Um, so with documentation of threats, with meetings with the city solicitor, with meetings with CPD, with meetings of other stakeholders, there's still no traction. What did the police say when you uh, showed them that, that evidence of threat? Very problematic, um, told me a number of ways to be more careful as the representative of the residential community um, and the person that was person, I was personally targeted because of the neighborhood council meeting, which I was running, not just that the council was targeted. Um, so ways for me to be safe, um, again, recommending that we make all of our complaints about the noise um, anonymous, but then by making them anonymous, they couldn't be called up. So in subsequent months, the police were coming back um, and telling us there were no complaints when we had lots of complaints recorded, but because we made them anonymously to protect ourselves per the recommendation of the police due to the threats, they weren't able to pull those up. So it, that has been a real challenge. The only advice really that we received was to be very cautious um, and additional steps to take to ensure my safety. So the police didn't feel that the threat rose to the level that they would be uh, forced to take action. Is that what they said? 
uh, it was not a uh, specific enough threat that I could take legal action against oh. the individual in question. Um, the individual has a uh, reason to behave differently due to other legal issues of that them themselves and their other issues. Um, but unless I was willing to go after and substantiate and take action personally, there was no way for them to do anything about that threat. I, I think that Mr. Slasco may have uh, spoken for me as well. I, I'm very supportive of the concept of this. I like the idea of marrying this sort of activity into the park. Uh, on the other hand, if what we're doing is expanding a, a problem that the city either can't or won't address, um, I, you know, are we better off saying no until we get to, till the city can figure out how they are going to address this? Excuse me, does this also include the timing? Are they exceeding the time limits that they're allowed to have the music on? Is that from, am I allowed to speak to that? Yeah, yeah, I'm asking you that question. Yeah, so it's within the um, time of around noon, uh, let's say on Saturday through 3 a.m., for instance, Sunday morning. So it's within the hours that the commercial district allows for greater noise. But again, on the residential side, it is exceeding at all times, especially at uh, those wee hours of the morning. So it, um, I guess the answer would be there is permission for those uh, noise levels at some level to be in the commercial district, but across the street, it is definitely outside of our hours. Okay. Is it, I'm sorry, it's at the, uh, the residential district though, that the sound is supposed to be measured. Yes, and that has been the other challenge is we have to give the addresses of the businesses in the commercial district. We then have to have the police contact us when we make these complaints so that instead of measuring it by commercial district levels, they go across the street into the residential district to measure from there, which most officers do not have time to do. And that is the reason we were advised to collect the levels over in our residential district. Um, because again, it's very confusing. This is in my written statement as well. It's very confusing for the police when we call them out that they are not taking the reading from the address where the complaint is occurring that it is happening across the street. If we give our residential addresses, there's no business affiliated with that and there's no way to tie that back to the businesses. May I ask a question sure. real quick? Um, were you sworn in? I was. Did you, I'll allow it, um, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask is um, the complaint that you're dealing with Abby, which, is, which seems horrendous to me, is it just singularly one place that's down here on Main Street? It's actually not on Main Street. That's, you know, it, um, I, I think if it was on Main Street, maybe the noise would be directed over into that commercial district better. It's more like the current uh, proposal, which is kind of behind Main Street, uh, sort of to the east of Main Street, right on the park, where again, there are fewer biz, uh, buildings to block the sound from traveling across the street. So it is one business, and well, it's, it's technically three businesses. Um, but sort of one general kind of block, one physical location. I, I was just curious more than not, just because everyone here is of the neighborhood, including our, our applicant, our, 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 our business owner. And so, you know, it's one of these things that one bad apple spoils the bunch. So I hope you can get a wrangle on what's going on across from your property and causing this, but hopefully that doesn't affect what's going on with the good businesses that are taking the diligence and doing what they're supposed to do to be good neighbors. So that's it, I was just curious. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Madam Chair, can I? I thought that was coming from someone else. Um, I, I do have kind of a follow-up to that. Um, I know that the the idea of you know good neighbor agreements or, or bonds or things that are outside the purview of this board, but may allow this board to feel a little more comfortable knowing that um, there are some existing issues uh, in this area. Would that be something that the owner and applicant would be um, willing to consider or just wanted to, to ask that question to see if there might be an openness to that? Because I, I agree that it's very unfortunate that this is happening and we don't want to make things even worse for these neighbor, neighbors that are going through it, but we also don't want to penalize someone who may be a great neighbor that never you know, causes any issues. 
would someone from uh, the owner be able to speak to that? Sure, this is Brandy with 3CDC. Um, we are completely open to a good neighbor agreement. Um, you know, we definitely understand the sound decimals um, requirements and fully plan to work with the tenant to make sure that those requirements are met. Um, you know, we have a fair amount of restaurant space um, that we operate with condos above, um, residential apartments above in all areas of the neighborhood. And we take noise issues very seriously. Um, I am familiar with the um, dining or the bar that Abby is speaking of. And, you know, we have the same concerns that she's had and hasn't had much luck. We're always happy to continue to work with Pendleton to see if we can get a solution on that end. Um, but we, you know, we take these noise issues very seriously. And this applicant, he is a restaurant. It's a small area. Um, we're hopeful to, um, you know, we're hopeful that the board sees everything that 3CDC and the city is trying to do in this area um, and votes um, for this today. Uh, Ms. Tosso, I'll give you just uh, uh, one minute to respond um, regarding if, if that sort of agreement would, would help alleviate some concerns. I wanted to say, first of all, 3CDC has been working with us on a variety of other issues in a really meaningful way in the last uh, six or nine months, and we really appreciate that. Um, and we do trust them to make meaningful efforts to help. Uh, that being said, it remains a major concern for the folks who have chosen to live in the residential district across the street where we are supposed to be guaranteed quiet enjoyment that we aren't able to achieve that through a variety of channels. And we have partnered with um, giants uh, who own large properties and have a good amount of sway, one would think at the city level without success. So that's not to say we couldn't achieve better success um, if we partnered with 3CDC and that's a great option. But I do wanna say that I think if all of us were to personalize the situation and imagine that um, this is something that you and your neighborhood were having to deal with despite a guarantee of a residential level of peace and enjoyment, um, I, I still think that most of these businesses are being granted the approval, the business in question has an approval from a historic board many years ago, and there just has to be some way to um, to have recourse, and that does not currently exist in the approvals that are coming from this board about this matter. So I'm, I'm sorry, was there a, a direct response to the owner and the community would be willing to enter into a good neighbor agreement? I see the good neighbor agreements. Um, so far in our experience, we are not able to include in those any kind of recourse, any um, consequences for the business. So we could certainly work on one. Um, unfortunately, most of the time, those are sort of a statement of good intent. But they're, again, in terms of enforceability, there's there's not typically any kind of enforceable uh, nature to the agreement or a consequence for the business necessarily. So I suppose that we could enter into one of those. Do we believe that that would guarantee us resolution um, or guarantee us our right to peaceful enjoyment. I do not think so. No, we have an enforcement issue. And the question that comes back to the board is, we have no enforcement powers. Are we going to uh, continue to grant operations uh, within the district that if they don't fulfill the obligation are basically unenforceable. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with, uh, because, it, because there is no easy answer here. If, if, the, if this can't be enforced, then whatever we pass is, is meaningless. People will do as they see fit. And I, I recognize that 3CDC is a very conscientious group uh, and it's probably not coming from their their property owners, but somehow we've got to get get to get to a point where enforcement is something that can happen. And the only way we have to uh, bring any pressure on that is to withhold uh, these uh, variances to the point where uh, the people who have enforcement capabilities make it a priority.
Are there any other questions or comments from the board? I just say, say I th this is really tough for me. I hate to penalize this group with this project. But on the other hand, uh, you know, unfortunately, this may be the only way we have to show how concerned we are about this problem. And that's where I'm I'm having a real problem here. <laughs> and it seems right. it, it seems to me unbelievable that this is happening with no recourse. And Madam I, I, I just I don't know where where we we have no recourse on this. So I I'm very confused about what to do here. Yeah, I've got to tell you, I'm very conflicted, too. It seems like it, it would be a great project. I just don't want to inflict any more discomfort on these neighbors. There's nothing worse than wanting to be in your home and having it nice and quiet, and you've got some noise that you can't do anything about. So I, on the one hand, I don't want to penalize the group that would probably come in and, and abide by um, the requirements. But at some point, we have to, to say, no, you either you do what you're supposed to do or you don't get the permission to even establish a business. Um, Allison, this is Brandy again. I would like to suggest maybe we could suspend the actual vote and let 3CDC work on some of these enforcement challenges and some um, discussions about a um, good neighbor agreement and come back to this board and present because you know, it would be unfortunate to hold this group accountable for another group's bad behavior. Well, it seems to me that you need to have a good neighbor agreement that has penalties in it and enforcement procedures in it so that in the event that <coughs> the re approvals are not complied with, those enforcement procedures, whether they're monetary penalties or injunctions or whatever they are, would come into play and it would be one of the participants to the agreement who have the right to take action on the enforcement proceedings. Well, I'm encouraged that uh, member three CDC is recognizing that enforcement has got to be addressed. And I, I for one, I would I'd make a motion that we table this subject to a a good neighbor agreement along the lines of what Mr. Weiss is suggesting, but also that uh, enforcement become a priority uh, so that uh, the, you know, all of the issues can be addressed in legal means in a timely way. Is there a second? Yeah, yeah, having, having said that, that motion. Okay, we, we just approved two. <laughs> I think I was responsible for one of those. Um, but I, I think a message needs to go to staff too that it sounds like the board's not going to approve these exceptions unless we have some commitment that there's some teeth to the uh, relief. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion to house. Yes. Is it? Is it helpful? I, I am not aware of the ongoing enforcement issues or the, the concerns that were raised on this call. Um, you know, would it be helpful if we we try and get some more background on just general process on enforcement for noise complaints and, and bring that to the board as well? Certainly. Yep. Certainly. Okay, so I, I think I think that's the sort of the point of my motion is uh, we all I, I think if I'm reading the sense of the board, this project is not something that we are opposed to, but recognizing this is our only lever to have enforcement actually work on something that we're being asked to make an exception for, uh, I would think that, yes, uh, Ms. Hayhouse, certainly uh, from the staff level, we'd like that information uh, and then Get, a, get an understanding of how this can work so that enforcement can happen for the rules that we're being asked to approve. 
Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, I will call the roll. And, and I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Ms. Chair, just to be clear, yes. the motion is to table this, correct? Yes. Uh, okay. Continue table, whichever, we, we always uh, forget which is the one that's most flexible for the, the applicant. My motion was to table. Second. Call the roll, Ms. Smith? Yes. Uh, Mr. Weiss? Yes. Uh, let's see. Mr. Voss? Yes. Mr. Zalasco? Yes. Mr. Sunderman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, so it looks like we will oh. be hearing this again. Uh, you didn't get my vote. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Young. You guys moved <laughs> around on my screen, um, and I therefore miss people. Mr. Young? Aye. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we'll be hearing this one again with some additional information provided uh, from uh, planning as well as hopefully some conversation between uh, the owner applicants and the neighbors. So thank you everyone for your time today. We will see you again soon on this item. Okay, moving on to item four. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is an application for certificate of appropriateness and zoning relief for 312 Main Street which is located in the third and main historic district in the downtown area. Uh, so this is an application for new building identification signage on the south mm -hmm. and west elevations of the building. Uh, it is a conversion of the existing structures into the Moxie Hotel. Uh, the applicant requires zoning relief for the proposed signage in the form of a dimensional variance of 48 square feet to allow a 199 square foot building ID sign on the west elevation, which is in excess of 151 square feet permitted. And they also require a variance to allow a building ident identification sign that is not directly affixed to the facade. So this uh, project has been before the board in the past for the conversion of the building and the exterior alterations that go along with it for the conversion to the hotel. Uh, the project has progressed and the applicant is now ready to submit their sign package for approval. So uh, you can see on the screen, this is the west elevation with the Moxie identification sign on the building. This is the sign that exceeds the square footage slightly. Uh, the main reason it exceeds that is because of the Y on the sign, which is the script logo for the Moxie Hotels. That Y drops down below the rest of the signage, which increases that, that sign area um, to above the allowable square footage. Otherwise, it would be about the exact right size. Um, the sign on the west elevation is also proposed along the top of the building. Uh, this is a, a larger elevation. So the sign, while well, larger than the west elevation sign, the south elevation sign does comply. It is actually below the allowable square footage. So um, both of these signs are intended to be viewed from a distance. Um, you can see how the sign on the west elevation is set back from the primary facade. Uh, and this is where they are not able to affix that directly to the facade because of the irregular shape of that addition wall. Um, so you can see they have the, the brackets proposed to bring it out so that it is level with that front face of the projection on that addition. Um, so staff does feel that these signs are appropriate in the interest of historic preservation. The only way to affix a sign to the facade of this building that's directly attached to the facade would be to have it on the historic elevation, which uh, would not be appropriate in the interest of historic preservation, or otherwise to place it fully back on this hidden portion of that addition, which would eliminate the visibility from the, the southwest when viewed towards the hotel. So. Um, staff does feel that that is appropriate. Um, a couple more renderings, which can show from the historic district boundaries, uh, that sign is very minimally visible above the parapet walls of the historic facade. <clears throat> and uh, you can see here from a distance how that gains more visibility once you're outside the historic district boundaries. Uh, the same is true for the south elevation. It's View, viewable from a distance, but not when you're directly in front of the buildings. 
Um, as far as the zoning relief is concerned, staff typically does not recommend approval for building ID sign size variances. Um, however, in this case, because of the unique characteristics of the historic building and the fact that when you combine the size of both the south elevation and the west elevation, their combined size is um, just slightly above what would be allowed if that was evenly divided between the two. Um, staff does feel that these are both appropriate as far as uh, preserving the historic character of the building. Uh, so with that being said, staff does recommend the Historic Conservation Board take the following action based on plans submitted by City Studios Architecture dated 4-11-2023. Approve a dimensional variance of 48 square feet to allow 199 square foot building identification sign on the west elevation and approve a variance to allow a building ident identification sign not directly affixed to the facade of the building. Staff also recommends approval of a certificate of appropriateness for 312 Main Street, including any revisions submitted for permit subject to staff review and approval, with the following condition that the building permits must be issued within two years of the decision date or the COA shall expire. Thank you. Uh, we do have an owner and a few applicants uh, signed up for this uh, item. Would any of you like to add to uh, the staff report? If so, we'll get you sworn in. Not seeing any takers. Uh, does the board have any questions for uh, staff or the applicants? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, uh, zoning relief and certificate of appropriateness for 312 Main Street in line with staff recommendations. And second. second. I'll call the roll. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. Zalasco? Aye. Mr. Sunderman? Aye. Mr. Voss? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, looks like you're approved and good to go on your signs. Thank you. And we will move on to item number five. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is an application for a certificate of appropriateness and zoning relief for 545 East 13th Street. This is an application for alterations to an existing non-contributing building within the Pendleton neighborhood and the Over the Rhine Historic District. Uh, the, the proposal is the conversion of an existing storage building into a single family dwelling that will include uh, new double hung windows throughout a new front wood, a new wood front door and a repaired carriage garage door. Uh, it also involves rebuilding the deteriorated rear wall of the structure along Boulevard Alley with CMU at ground level and wood frame construction above, as well as a roof addition and a rooftop deck. Um, the project does require zoning relief in the form of a dimensional variance of five feet to allow a total side yard setback of zero, which is short of the required total of five feet. Um, sure. Screen the applicants have provided a rendering that shows the proposed building compared to the existing. Uh, you can see in the rendering there is a small section of the rear addition that extends above the top of the parapet that will be visible uh, from the street. This is placed towards the center of the building, so it's not directly up at the street level, but uh, that additional height that's proposed will be visible from the street. Um, in general, staff feels that this is a, an appropriate alteration to an existing non-contributing building. Um, the rear wall is substantially deteriorated and it is proposed to be rebuilt with, um, with CMU below grade, or uh, sorry, not below grade, but on the first floor, which is below grade from the street in front, the elevation drops off. Uh, and then the upper level would be frame construction clad with um, 
metal siding. The roof deck above that would have a black metal railing at the wall, at the uh, basically the plane of that existing wall um, with the new addition built above that. So from the rear, that's primary, primarily glass to allow light and views uh, towards the city. And this projection at the top is the portion that would extend above um, into the view shed when you're viewing from across the street on East 13th Street. Um, so as far as staff can tell based on the floor plans, it looks like this projection is primarily intended to allow additional light into the um, interior of the building through the clerestory windows that are, are uh, established on that top portion. So um, staff feels that in general, the proposed changes to the building are appropriate as the addition is placed towards the center and rear of the building uh, to make it less visible from the street. Staff does have a concern with the, the central projection and its visibility. While this is a non-contributing structure currently in the guidelines, um, it still does need to comply with the addition section of the guidelines, which state that nothing should be highly visible from the street level. Um, because of the fact that it doesn't have um, a, a strong justification, as far as I can see, for um, the functionality of the building, but is primarily intended to allow light into the building, the staff does recommend that that portion be lowered um, by about just under five feet, which um, in the staff report, you can see the diagram um, where that red line is, which would allow that to, to basically not be visible from the street or only minimally, minimally visible when viewed from an oblique angle um, while still allowing if the applicant would like um, to provide skylights or some other form of um, of application to allow light to continue to enter into that area. Um, so with that being said, staff does recommend the Historic Conservation Board take the following actions per plans by Team B Architecture and Design dated 3-10-2023. Approve the dimensional variance of five feet to allow a total side yard setback of zero, short of the required five feet. Uh, I should mention this is a fairly standard variance in historic districts. The existing building is built lot line to lot line, and this is just extending that um, height of those walls upward, so it's not significantly altering the existing setback. Uh, staff also recommends approval of the Certificate of Appropriateness for 545 East 13th Street, sub including any revisions submitted for permit, subject to staff review and approval with the following conditions that the semicircular portion of the addition that is visible from East 13th Street shall be reduced in height by approximately 4.75 feet to reduce visibility from the primary street, and that the CMU material on the rear elevation shall have a textured finish, and that the building permits must be issued within two years of the decision date or the COA shall expire. Thank you. Uh, it does look like we have two uh, representatives from the architect uh, on the call. Would either of you like to speak or respond to the proposed condition uh, given by staff? If so, uh, we'll get uh, Mr. Sturkey to swear you in. Uh, yeah, I'd like to respond real quick. Um, sure, if you could raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, yes. Um, I'd just like to say that uh, we welcome the recommendations for the reduced height from Doug. That's it. Great. So you'd be amenable to that change. Yes. Perfect. Uh, any questions uh, from the board for staff or the applicant? I have a question for Mr. Corns. Mr. Corns, this building is very much out of character with the rest of East 13th Street. I'm I'm wondering. Okay. Uh, I, I I guess I I just was wondering. Would 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 you at all think about demolishing that building and building a different building rather um, than? Sorry, um, didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, That's okay. I think uh, the owner of the building is a longtime Pendleton res resident. Um, he lives down the street, um, and you would see that 
uh, across the street and two houses down, there's actually another single story, um, double wide lot warehouse um, across the street from them on the north side of 13th. Um, and the only and that one is historically um, in line, or it's it's a historic building. And the only reason why that one is and this one isn't is because of the brick facade to it. Well, this is stick built. Um, I believe I'm right if, on that, Doug. I'm not sure, but. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I can check the non-contributing list if if the board desires and, and let you know on that. Yeah, wouldn't it be but, the date? Um, what is that? Wouldn't it be the date? Uh, yeah, I mean, this building, I believe, was built around 1900, 18, late 1800s as well. Um, yeah, and if... I can clarify on on this particular building. It is currently listed as a non-contributing building, uh, but I should mention that in the revised over the Rhine guidelines that are were previously approved by the board and and subsequently approved by Planning Commission and is currently headed to City Council. This building is changed from a non-contributing building to a contributing building due to its date of construction. And I think that's why we would uh, go with uh, Doug's suggestions on lowering it to not be visible. And then um, just to kind of adhere more in line with contributing buildings. So Mr. Owen, I'm, I'm sorry, if, if you evaluate it, I know the city has where proposals are not necessarily enacted yet, but under consideration that those proposals have to be considered if they're registered or whatever the formality is. Would you evaluate this building differently if it was listed as a contributing building? Um, no, my analysis on this based on the current scope would be the same to just reduce the height of that addition. I believe that if this were listed currently as a contributing building, um, the proposed alterations that they're making here would be in line with the alterations to a, a historic building. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for staff or the applicant? If not, I will entertain a motion. Don't all jump. I make a motion to uh, approve the uh, zoning uh, relief and certificate of appropriateness in line with the staff recommendation for 545 East 13th Street. Second. Second. So that, just for clarity, that does include the recommendation to lower the, the upper portion of the building. Correct, yes. Yeah. Great. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Uh, I will call the roll. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. Sunderman? Yes. Mr. Voss? Aye. Mr. Zalasco? Aye. The chair votes aye. Uh, thank you. It looks like you are approved. Uh, we will move on to the next item. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is an application for certificate of appropriateness and zoning relief for 242 West McMicken Avenue. <clears throat> this is in the Over the Rhine and Tough neighborhoods, and it's within the Stone Mohawk Historic District. Uh, this is an application for alterations to the former Felsenbrau um, Cliffside Brewery building along McMicken. Uh, this has been before the board previously uh, a couple times um, for previous phases of the project. Uh, so the current phase is tackling the original historic brewery, uh, or the, I guess I should say the, the oldest remaining portion of the brewery on the, the western edge of, of the lot. So um, the proposal consists primarily of the, the complete interior rehabilitation of the building 
as well as um, new additions on the building. Um, so on the site plan, you can see in front of you, the primary change is the addition on the southwest corner of the property, which is the location of the, the formerly the oldest portion of this brewery, which was demolished back in 2010 um, due to its imminent collapse. Um, so the applicant is proposing rebuilding on the existing foundation of that building in a similar footprint and, and massing as what was there previously. Uh, they are also proposing to rebuild the cupola atop the 1886 portion of the building. Uh, and there will also be a roof deck on the 1937 portion of the building. That roof deck is primarily towards the McMicken side. Uh, and there is a room addition on the rear corner of that rooftop addition that will house a kitchen and restroom facilities uh, for the roof deck. Uh, there's also a stair tower addition proposed um, on the rear of the building uh, towards the center. Um, so the, the proposal with the renovation would basically make this uh, an eating and drinking establishment in this portion of the building uh, that would also include an event center. Um, so the, the zoning relief required based on this proposal includes conditional use approval for that event center, which is classified as a commercial meeting facility in the zoning code, which is a conditional use approval in the UM zoning district. They also require a dimensional variance of 22 feet for the proposed height of 67 feet in excess of the 45 foot limit. Uh, and conditional use approval is also required for an outdoor area within 100 feet of a residential zoning district located to the north. Um, conditional use approval is also required to allow the proposed outdoor entertainment on that roof deck area. Um, <clears throat> Staff generally feels that the requested zoning relief is appropriate. Um, a commercial meeting facility in this location was previously approved for a former version of this project uh, several years ago that never came to fruition. Um, staff feels that a, an event center is appropriate in the UN district uh, that would closely um, be related to the eating and drinking establishment that is proposed within the building as well. Uh, as far as the outdoor area that is proposed on the McMicken side of the property on the roof deck, um, and it will be set back from the front elevation so as to not be visible. Staff feels that um, that is appropriate. The outdoor entertainment that's proposed is does consist of ambient background music on speakers. Um, so again, staff recommends approval of, of of that aspect of it as well. Um, as far as the certificate of appropriateness is concerned, <clears throat> staff feels that this is appropriate in the historic interest of historic preservation. Um, the primary addition at the street level on the corner of the building, um, as I mentioned, it's in the same general footprint as the original brewery building that stood on this site until 2010. It is slightly taller, although the original building was three stories and, and rose to a similar height after the third story addition was placed on the building. Um, it is, it does meet the conservation guidelines in the form of rhythm, um, heights, as well as um, emphasis, vertical emphasis. Uh, and so on. So staff does feel that it is generally appropriate. The materials are also appropriate. They will be modern materials to help differentiate from the historic building. A modern brick will be used as well as a uh, cast stone molding for the banding on the building. And the windows are proposed to be double hung wood windows. So staff does generally feel that that is appropriate. Uh, the other addition that is towards the front of the building consists of the roof deck structure, but as I mentioned, this will be set back from the front facade of the building so that um, those elements that are built up on the roof deck will not be visible when viewed from across the street. So um, 
the rear portion of the rooftop deck, including the kitchen space and the restrooms, will have visibility from Mohawk, uh, in part because the street is higher at this elevation and there is less ornamentation that would block that from view. Um, so considering the more utilitarian nature of this building when viewed from Mohawk, staff feels that the visibility that will occur um, when viewed from the rear will not be detrimental to the character of the building or the district uh, because it does kind of blend in with that utilitarian nature of the of the view from Mohawk. So it will be clad in a, a dark colored fiber cement siding so that it will further blend into the background there. Um, so staff does feel that that addition is appropriate. Uh, and then on the rear, um, you can see this is the rooftop addition that will house that kitchen area. Um, this is set back, so it's not going to be as obvious as it looks in, in the elevation view. Uh, and the same with the stair tower addition, stair enclosure that will be placed towards the center of that building uh, that is not right along the street level. So that will also um, not have have strong visibility when viewed from the rear because you're looking over the other portions of that structure. Um, so staff does feel that the proposed additions that are uh, to be placed on the building are appropriate and substantially conform with the historic conservation guidelines. Uh, so staff does recommend the Historic Conservation Board take the following actions based on plans by Drawing Department dated 3-10-2023. Um, approve the conditional use approval for a commercial meeting facility. Approve the dimensional variance of 22 feet for the proposed height of 67 feet in excess of the 45 foot limit. Uh, and I should say that is primarily at the rear um, addition height which is slightly lower than the historic portion of the brewery. Uh, staff also recommends approval for the outdoor area within 100 feet of a residential zoning district and approve uh, the conditional use approval for outdoor entertainment within 500 feet of a residential zoning district. Staff recommends approval of the certificate of appropriateness for 246 West McMicken Avenue, including any revision submitted for permit subject to staff review and approval with the following conditions that the building permit must be issued within two years of the decision date or the COA shall expire. Thank you. We do have a few applicants uh, signed into the meeting. Would, if any of you would like to add to what Mr. Owen has uh, told us, uh, please uh, raise your hand and we'll get you sworn in. Okay, Mr. Novak, I think has already been sworn in. So please go ahead and and add what you would like. Um, I'd just like to say that, you know, we've been working on this building and these properties for probably about, I don't know, somewhere around eight years now. And it's really great to be able to bring it back to the neighborhood as a catalyst project. Um, we're hopeful that, you know, your, your recommendations um, for approval will be held because I think it's an important project for the neighborhood at large. So I just wanted to say that. Would any other applicants like to speak? Not seeing any. Are there any questions from the board for either staff or the applicants? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion. Madam Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve both the zoning relief and the certificate of appropriateness as laid out by staff. Thank you. Okay, I will call the roll. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. Sunderman? Aye. Mr. Voss? I don't feel like we have uh, some of the issues that we discussed earlier that are here. I, I think this is a little bit different situation, so I vote aye. Mr. Zalasco? Aye. The chair votes aye. Uh, thank you. It looks like your approval is good. And uh, we'll move on to item seven. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, finally, today we have an application for a certificate 
of appropriateness uh, for 3003 Fairfield Avenue. This is actually an appeal of a staff approved certificate of appropriateness uh, at 3003 Fairfield. The application was for the replacement of two basement level um, windows, wood frame windows uh, with a glass block material. Uh, the application was reviewed by staff on January 19th, 2023, and a certificate of appropriateness was issued for the project. Uh, so sub subsequently, we did receive an appeal to that decision. Uh, so it is in front of the board today. So um, 3003 Fairfield is an existing residence, um, whereas the the owner submitted the application for the two glass block windows for the reasons of safety. Uh, the two windows in question are on the south elevation of the building, which is a side elevation, but it is a corner lot, so it does have visibility from DeSales Lane. Uh, the primary front is on Fairfield Avenue, um, and the the two glass the two windows in question are towards the the rear of the building. We do have an image that was supplied by the applicant of the appeal. Um, so you can see the, the the two windows that were replaced are on the rear bay window that faces DeSales Lane. So um, staff reviewed the application and while it while these two windows do have visibility um, from the side street, staff did feel that it was generally appropriate. Um, they do the glass block windows, while not matching the same material as the originals, uh, they do fill the entire openings and the existing building has several other glass block windows. And viewing other properties in the neighborhood after I received the application, there are several other properties, uh, perhaps even a majority of properties that have glass block window in the basement level windows. Uh, it's a common condition, not only for the East Walnut Hills Historic District, but across the city. Um, so staff did feel that rather than uh, taking this to the board for approval, it was something that was appropriate at the staff level. So uh, the staff COA approval was issued. So um, staff does make the recommendation to the board that they uphold a staff level certificate of appropriateness for the installation of two glass block windows on the south elevation of 3003 Fairfield Avenue. Okay, we do have uh, both the applicant and the homeowner signed up. Uh, Mr. Campbell is the applicant. Uh, I will uh, allow you to speak first if you would like to. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sturkey will sign you in or swear you in. Uh, Mr. Campbell, if you could raise your right hand, I need you to answer out yes. loud. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. So what would you like to tell us about your application that staff has not already told us? Well, this is a um, photograph of the window that was existing and had been there since we've lived in this house for 36 years, was in place. And there was never a safety issue with this. Um, it is architecturally appropriate, whereas the glass block windows are not. And in the interest of artistic, of historic preservation, glass block windows do not seem to meet the criteria. Um, they are not an improvement in any way, nor are they even a replacement. They do not enhance the integrity of the building in any way, nor do they fit to a landmark designation. So um, I think it's inappropriate to give an approval for this. Um, the um, aspect also at night is quite concerning. Um, so you, you see what was originally there and what was replaced in this photograph. And you can see it is not an improvement. It is a uh, decline in the architectural fabric and integrity of the building. And in 
it's on the side. It's not really on the rear of the building. It faces on to the South Lane and it is a visible from Fairfield Avenue. So it is visible from both of those streets. The South Lane uh, tees uh, into uh, Fairfield Avenue there. The um, idea that these windows were uh, deteriorating uh, is not the case as I both held the windows and um, the previous owner was meticulous in his maintenance of this house. Uh, and you can see from the photographs that they're not deteriorated. Um, they were operable, they were hinged, and um, they were an integral part of the architectural presentation. So um, I would put forward a motion that um, these glass block windows um, do not meet the criteria of a historic district, this particular location, and that they should be removed. Thank you. Uh, I will now recognize the owner, Mr. Jenkins, uh, if you'd like to be sworn in and we can uh, hear your response. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, what would you like to tell us in response? Um, well, I hate to belabor it, but I, I guess since there were some things stated that uh, we should just make a short record of it. First of all, the statement that there was never a safety issue uh, with these windows. Um, the windows, when I purchased the home last July, were boarded over from the inside and the outside. I have an image I could share. Someone doesn't want me to go off onto these issues, say the word, and I'll just forget about it. They are in your packet. Uh, they were boarded over from the inside and the outside uh, because they were deteriorated. Um, and uh, we wanted to use this room in the basement because it was semi-finished uh, for an exercise room. When we removed the boards, we found the deteriorated windows. And if I'm allowed to share my screen, I can show you the image that was submitted with my response. Is that okay to do? We do have that image, but you're welcome to share it if you would like to. Well, it, you know, look, I'm really sensitive to about how long these things go on, given what I do. If you'd rather I don't, I'm happy to, to dispense with it. Uh, so, board members, would anyone like to see the image? Or no, I'd, I'd like to see it. All right, I will share my screen then if I can do this correctly. Um, I think I'm doing that right. Am I doing that right? You are, yes. Uh, we, can, okay. we can see your screen now. Okay. So here is what it looked like inside and outside after we bought it. There were um, boards over the, uh, the two windows. And uh, these are pictures of the windows inside and out after they were removed in my basement. Um, the pictures that my neighbor Jack has provided you with were taken from a distance uh, after they were removed. These are what they look like now. If we were doing an in-person hearing, I would have brought them with me. Here is some close-ups of what we found when we took the windows out. These holes in the corners. One of them has a missing pane now. I can't say from recollection whether that happened in the course of removal or not. They were flimsy and they were broken and they were cracked. And they were covered up before we went through this process. Um, and to the point that Jack made that uh, the aspect at night bothers him, how the, there's light coming from the windows. I just note that I would have been well within my rights to remove the boards and try to get by with these, uh, these broken and deteriorated windows and light would have come out of them at night. And that, that's a, that's a non-issue truly. But the real issue is that there was a genuine safety concern. I don't want to belabor um, my position or what I do, but the fact of the matter is that I started receiving overt hostile uh, threats uh, last September and October because of my job. Um, as some of you might know, I'm a Hamilton County Court of Common Pleas judge. I rendered a decision in a high profile case that became very controversial and popular, and it put me in the position where we had death threats. And here's just some of the national media 
that covered that decision that I rendered. Um, that was when I went into high gear to replace these windows and to uh, do some other security measures around the house. Those windows weren't secure. The person that I spoke to about our security uh, said they were dangerous. <clears throat> and so we, uh, we got them replaced. We have two young children in the house and, and my 19-year-old daughter. So we took the security set, the threats seriously, um, turned them over to the uh, judicial protection people at the sheriff's office, and we followed the recommendations of the folks we got advice from. Um, so the, uh, the idea that I needed to get a permit actually was sort of a surprise, and I think it helps to understand why we did it. Uh, I actually called Jack the day before we were doing the window work to talk to him about it. I wasn't aware of his objection, uh, but he made it clear that he had an objection. So I called building inspections, found out what to do. They turned me over to the urban conservator, and we sought the conditional or the certificate of approval. Um, so we did that before the windows were installed. This is what they look like today. Um, this is the side of the house that faces a one-way alley known as DeSales Lane. Um, and they are, they are visible from the alley. And Jack sits directly across the alley from me. One of the two windows is also visible if you try to see it from Fairfield Avenue. The other is not because of the shape of the bump out in the house. You can't see uh, the other, the back one from that. Note that these are along the side of a fence, a fenced in backyard. One of the things that I offered to do for Jack if he really objected to the, uh, the glass block windows was to put some bushes in front of them. Um, that did not seem to address his concerns. We are getting ready to replace that fence. We have a, uh, a permit that was passed on to us from the prior owner to build a garage and redo the backyard. One of the things we'd like to do is redo that fence. If it would allay his concerns, if he's really that offended by the glass block, we'd be glad to put the fence in a position if we were allowed to, where it would obscure his view of the glass block windows. Uh, but I, my understanding from talking to Jack, uh, and, he, and he has been a delightful neighbor so far, except for this issue, is that those measures that I've offered to do don't address his concerns. He seems more concerned with um, telling me that I can't have glass block windows, which I feel I need. The, um, I took a little survey of the neighborhood. I count 38 houses between um, on the two blocks that I'm on within the historic district. Fairfield Avenue runs from Madison back to Dexter. And it looks like there are 38 houses. I can view 17 of them from the street as having glass block window. The three in this image all sit on corners like mine. The first two uh, are on Madison Avenue, or Madison Road and Fairfield, and they have glass block facing Madison Road. Those are the, the 1736 and 1806 have glass block facing Madison Road. One of those houses is also owned by one of my colleagues here in the judiciary. The other house is at the end of the street on Dexter. It has glass block on both sides, both facing Dexter and facing Fairfield. That's 3061 Fairfield. So then I went through the rest of the street and you can see that at least half of the house is half glass block that is visible from Fairfield. I didn't feel like I could trespass. Uh, so these are the ones I could see from the street. 3020 has glass block facing the, uh, the street on Fairfield. Um, all of these have glass block visible from the street. Many of them are very similar to the ones that I installed after getting the certificate. 3015 has glass block on both sides, as does 2930, which is the last one on the last image and the first one here. And all of these have glass block visible from the street on the sides of their houses. This is an image of Jack's house from my house. Um, I think it's actually off point, but the point is, is that I think the glass block, uh, while it offends him, uh, the view I have from my side of the street is not exactly attractive either. Uh, but I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, he will do what he's doing. So put a little summary in here. Um, glass block is ubiquitous in Fair, on, the, on our block at least. Um, and the historic district actually goes just a little bit past um, the end of our block. It might be helpful to see a map of it. I don't know if my cursor is visible, but my house is right here if my cursor shows up. 
and that, that goes all the way down to the end of Fairfield or to Dexter and then a little further. So there's probably some more houses in there. Um, but that's everything I have, unless there are questions for me. I thought we did everything right and we still want to be good neighbors. We're happy to obscure the view of the windows in a reasonable way, either with some bushes uh, or with some uh, fencing, whatever is, is most satisfactory. Um, and then to the point that the previous owner was meticulous, I don't know if any of you have ever owned a house that is um, 243 years old and very large, but yeah, he was a pretty good guy. He did some neat things. Uh, we have headaches every day, but that's what we signed up for. Uh, we're dedicated to bringing the house back to what it could be. And uh, hopefully this is the kind of thing that we can get through. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Are there any initial uh, comments or questions from the board for yes. your staff? Okay, go ahead, Mr. Ross. Uh, Mr. Owen, am I, am I correct that the certificate or the certificate of appropriateness was approved? Correct. All right. Well, and I, I have a comment. I live three blocks away from this house. And oh, I li literally, uh, I, I am the first house out of the historic district. The first thing I did when I moved in was put in glass block windows in my basement because security is an issue. Um, and yes, they are ubiquitous in all these historic houses. I loathe glass block and I put it in my house for exactly the reason that you're talking about. I think, you know, I, I, I appreciate the effort and I would ask uh, as a condition uh, of uh, the moving forward that a reasonable effort is made to conceal them. They, they are, you know, the, the one uh, picture at night is stark. Um, and whether that's through a fence closer to the property line or bushes, uh, but I, I don't know, I don't know how we say a given your particular circumstance. No, we're revoking the city's uh, agreement to let you do that. Um, and second, you know, how, how do we address a real con security concern? Even though I don't, as I say, I don't like glass block, but it is the uh, best solution for the problem that uh, we have in East Walnut Hills. Are there any additional comments or questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Campbell, I'll give you just a couple minutes to respond. I, I know there were, were lots of items that Mr. Jenkins brought up. If you'd like a, a few minutes to, to respond to what was indicated, um, please do so now. Um, the photograph that I showed would indicate that these windows had been restored in some fashion because they do not match with the photographs that were presented in which they're painted black. Um, I don't recall these ever being boarded up, but they, it's always possible, of course, but I never saw them boarded. Um, I had offered to reinforce these existing windows before they were replaced uh, with steel at my cost to facilitate uh, you know, a good working relationship and um, that would have solved a lot of the security questions. Uh, also, there can be interior, um, anything from blast curtains to uh, fencing of some kind to be put on the interior and still retain the architectural characteristics. So what has happened is that, yes, they've proliferated, but it's more reason not to have them proliferate anymore. And this is a, an architectural feature of this house. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting that these photographs, <laughs> my actual perceptions of these 
windows because I had them in hand and I don't know if the judge still has these uh, or not, but they are dramatically different from what he has shown. Thank you. I gave Mr. Campbell a minute if you'd like to respond to any of those uh, comments, give you a moment to respond as well. I mean, the, the windows are what was taken out by the um, the person who put the glass block in. They're painted white on one side, and it looks like they had been painted a couple of times, but they're old and brown on the inside. See if I can bring that up. Am I still sharing my screen? No, you're not. Well, I'm not good at this. There we go. There we go. So the outside of them is white and it oh, looks like still no screen for me anyway. Oh. oh, you have to actually hit two buttons to do that. Share. There we go. So the outside is white and the inside is brown. And what Mr. Uh, Campbell took a picture of from the street and, and zoomed in on is the, is the white side, which was leaning against the house. The brown side is what was on the inside. Um, and then the state of them when we bought the place was um, this is what it looked like. These are the outside are black boards that the owner had. And then on the inside were um, boards that he had put on. One of them is hinged that you could swing open. The other was just sort of nailed in there. One of the reasons that Jack probably didn't notice this is if you can't tell um, the entire side of the house was overgrown. Um, there's a very large tree that was taken out. We had to take it out to get the house insured at a cost of about $7,500. And this entire area on this side of the house was overgrown with poison ivy and weeds and bushes and whatnot. The prior owner sort of let the place go after his wife died and he decided to move out. It was vacant for, uh, I don't know how long, my understanding was eight months or so that it was vacant before uh, we came in and bought it, uh, even though he did uh, you know, keep it up. So. I do have those windows. Uh, if we were doing an in-person hearing, I would have brought them with me. Uh, so that, that's what I got from the guy who took them out. That's all I can say about that. Thank you. Additional questions or comments from the board? Yes. Uh, yes, Mr. I have one other comment. Um, I, I know that on a number of historic projects that I was involved in where windows for environmental reasons or deterioration, we were required to preserve those windows. Uh, the, the idea from the Department of Interior at that point was if we ever got to a very different place, we would have exact exacting measurements on what, that, what, what those materials were. So I, I would, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd like to make a motion. And that is that uh, we uphold the staff level certificate of appropriateness for the installation of the two glass block windows on the south elevation of 3003 Fairfield Avenue with two conditions. One, that the uh, owner of the property preserve the windows put them in storage somewhere, and that they make a reasonable effort to screen the windows from uh, the lane and particularly from Fairfax. Mr. Sturkey, how do you feel about that language? Yeah, so possibility? Was the, the first condition was to, to keep the windows, preserve them? Yes. Um, so I, I wouldn't put that uh, condition on the decision unless we are absolutely certain that the owner still has the windows and um, that that's something that he can reasonably accommodate. Um, and the second is the second condition, if you'd like some sort of screening or buffering, oftentimes we will um, add that, that that screening or buffering needs to be um, reviewed by staff and again approved at a staff level so that it's appropriate. I'm perfectly comfortable with the second as to the first. 
uh, I guess the question can be asked, uh, are the windows still there? They're in my basement. Okay. Not particularly fond of uh, storing them. Where do you want me to put them? Can I bring them over to your house? <laughs> sure, bring them right over. My wife would love that answer. Right. Um, that that was the, uh, and I. it's been a while since I've had the conversation, but that was the compromise with the Department of Interior when particularly windows were coming out and being replaced with almost anything else that they, you know, create a box, put them someplace. And again, uh, this is a honor system, but uh, I'm trying to find a compromise that at some point when security in the future is not an issue uh, and or economics uh, or, or building technology provides something better, that they, you know, that, that at least they would be the basis for something. And, and that may be a better answer is uh, do some full documentation on them so that they could sometime in the future when somebody decides that they want to fully restore this house, uh, they would have that documentation of what was there. Uh, Ms. Chair, to the um, board member, I you know, uh, just reflect on this a little bit more. I, I, I don't know that that condition would be forcible in, in any meaningful way. And I, um, I would need to do some more research to see if it's even um, something that we're legally uh, legally uh, capable of, of imposing All right. on a particular property. I'll drop condition number one. Um, I, I like the modification, make a reasonable effort to screen uh, to be approved by uh, the staff. Is there a second to that? Second. Motion? Okay, I will call the roll. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. Sunderman? Aye. Mr. Voss? Aye. Mr. Zalasco? Aye. And the chair votes aye. <clears throat> Okay, it looks like the original uh, certificate of appropriateness is upheld with one condition to provide screening to be approved by staff. Great. Okay, are, are there any other agenda items for today? We have to approve uh, the March certificate of staff level certificate of appropriateness. I move that we do so. Thank you, sir. I'll call the roll. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. Sunderman? Aye. Mr. Voss? Aye. Mr. Zalasco? Aye. And the chair votes aye. I think that's the end of the agenda. If so, I will entertain a motion regarding adjournment. So, so moved. Move. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.